You can? Okay, good. I just want to test because I I saw some people talking, I cannot hear anything. So uh, maybe it's muted. So is the uh, sound good enough? It's, yes. it's very good, very clear. Okay, good. Then. So I'm ready then. And right. You can? Okay, yes. good. I just want to test because I... Okay. And uh, uh, Professor Zheng Han, I yeah. also assign you as a co-host, so you can share a screen if you want to. Oh, sure. If you, uh, yeah, let me share the screen. Yeah. If you want to test. Uh, yeah, it says this will stop other screen sharing, so I guess that's okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Great. Oh, uh, I think I stopped the video. Should I turn the video on or should I just keep this way? Any way you prefer. Okay. Uh, I think people will see the screen anyway, so maybe that's fine. Uh, Okay, let me turn on. I have to stop sharing for a moment because I need to turn on the video. Let me turn on the video just to be. Okay, I think that's better. Looks good. It looks good. Okay. Is this PowerPoint or is this uh, maybe in the keynote? It has to be a PowerPoint, right? It's Microsoft. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a uh, it's PowerPoint. Uh, you know, it's not because I work for Microsoft. I like PowerPoint. I like it for a totally different reason. So. It's, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. So uh, when I started to learn uh, to give talks using computer and uh, because I'm a topologist, I have to draw pictures. And I soon found out that actually PowerPoint is uh, pretty good as uh, something, you know, you can draw pictures and you can also write Chinese. <laughs> So, so that's okay. I started to use PowerPoint. Oh, by the way, you should uh, feel relaxed and take your time. So don't worry about go over time. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Actually, pretty sure. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I think 
would be the easiest for me if you know people ask question uh, because I definitely think I prepare more than I can cover and uh, it's really I will I will take it slow so uh, you know just go slow you know as dictated by questions and also uh, I do follow lots of your suggestions so we'll see. You know the the best record so far. Uh, there's a professor who sp spent three hours, more oh, than three really? hours, for the ninety minutes. Uh, and we still we still welcome. And it's, it's, okay, it's, sure, but uh, <laughs> I don't think I can go that long. Uh, I need to do something like uh, my wife already gave me an order to do something around twelve ten. So I don't think I go uh, beyond too much. Maybe we'll wait a short gong and uh, let's see. Uh, I think it's a seminar, right? So could be very informal, so no rush. Uh, Suhan, do you know where Lanati is coming? Who? I'm, I'm asking Suhan, Sao Suhan, where Lanati Cyber is coming. No, Nati is oh. not coming today. I oh, think okay. he has he has to give a talk. Uh, at oh, this no point. problem. So maybe. No. So we can start. Let me introduce. Just record. Sure. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to Harvard University CMSA Center for Mathematical Science and Application Quantum Matter Seminar Series. Uh, uh, seminar series. Uh, today is our great honor to have a professor, uh, Zhang Han Wang, from uh, Microsoft Station Q and the UC. SB Santa Barbara. Uh, Professor Zheng Han Wang uh, studied his PhD at the UCSD under Michael Friedman. And later on, uh, he works on uh, a lot of uh, different works in mass physics and also strongly related to the topics in topology. And he also works on uh, several, he has several contributions. Uh, important lemma works on topological quantum computations, in, including beautiful lectures and beautiful books he, he written. And also, other than, other than that, he also um, work on category theories, topological quantum field theories, and many important papers. And today's all great honor, uh, he, uh, he will give us uh, lectures on his lemma works, related to his lemma work, uh, with uh, Kevin Walker, the so-called uh, uh, Walker one model, and also relation to the Quinn-Yetter TQFT. His topics and title will be a Riemann sum of quantum field theory, latest Hamiltonian realization of uh, TQFTs. I would like to in, uh, invite and welcome the audience to ask and interrupt questions. We don't need to be limited to the time constraint. So don't worry to go over time. So let's welcome Zheng Han. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank so I think first I want to thank Jeremy for the uh, invitation. And uh, I will more or less uh, first, at least for the first hour, to follow his suggestions uh, to talk about the lattice model I wrote down with Kevin Walker many years ago. And uh, I will start with, uh, I think, you know, for those who know, I by training, I'm a mathematician, so I will give the talk today uh, in a math tradition, which is go from generality to uh, specific. I know physicists prefer the other way. Uh, I learned this from Alex Kitaya for early days, which is uh, physicists prefer to start with example. But uh, I think, thanks to Jeremy asked me uh, to uh, start with the uh, conceptual origins of the model. 
So I will do uh, the kind of a math uh, tradition, which is go from uh, greater generality, then finally go down to the very specific way to do it. And as Jeremy mentioned, I really hope people have questions, you know, because I don't really know at this kind of a Zoom aid, I don't even know, you know, the audience. So uh, that's uh, not a good thing to give a talk. So uh, with that, so I will start with the generality. Uh, so the model I wrote down with Kevin Walker uh, many years ago has an origin really, really uh, back to all the way where I started to do, uh, you know, think about top particle quantum computing. Uh, you know, more or less what I do for the last 15, 20 years, they all one way or the other related to top particle quantum computing. So uh, the question which came up at the very early days was, uh, when Michael Friedman, Michael Larson, and I proved that mathematically uh, you can do a universal quantum computation with top particle quantum field theory, in particular uh, the so-called within trans simon theory. And then uh, Michael Friedman became interested in uh, real things, which means he really wants to build a quantum computer. So he started to talk to uh, physicists. I believe the person most responsible for this question is probably Matthew Fisher. So they ask Mike, uh, you know, can you really prove in principle you can build a top particle quantum computer? And uh, the since they are uh, they were asking, is really can you write down a lattice Hamiltonian with basic parts so that you can realize a universal anion? Uh, so that's actually the kind of origin which started for, you know, for us to think about the question, you know, how to realize top particle quantum field theories using lattice models. And uh, I have to say, you know, after so many years, ask so many great progress, the original problem is still there. I don't think anybody has solved it mathematically, which is, can you write down a lattice model to realize two-dimensional lattice model gapped to realize the Fibonacci anions. I think this is still open. And uh, there are two uh, much relevant solutions, which I will mention uh, really the second one, which is the solution I give with Kevin. One was you double the theory. So that's the famous Lemon Wayne model. So you don't quite get Fibonacci anion. You get double the Fibonacci anion. And another solution is you go one dimension higher. And that's actually uh, the model I have with Kelvin. So this is really the beginning for us. Uh, actually, it's a quite a process to learn things. So, so that's really the starting point of you know, this model. And uh, before I give you know, uh, the kind of description of this, I want to make it very clear assumptions so that you know, we don't have, uh, we won't be wasting time. If, you know, on terminologies. So by lattice model here, I mean uh, something very uniform, which means I would think about, you know, we have a lattice and in reality, you might think about an atom or something. And there's a finite degree of freedom on them. And I want a Hamiltonian has a bounded range uniformly, which means no matter how big the size of the lattice and the range of interaction is always a fixed number. Uh, it could be unrealistic, you know, not two, three, four, could be 20, but has to be a fixed number. And the model is only for spins or bosons, if you want, there are no fermions. Uh, fermions are just too complicated for me at the moment. So that's the first assumption I want to make. So lattice model are kind of this ultra local bosonic uh, has a bounded range of interactions. And also I want very special Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian have some local terms. Now all the local terms are Hermitian projectors that commute to each other. Uh, or if they don't Hermitian, they have to come in pairs. So uh, that automatically imply a very difficult mathematical question in general. How do you know your Hamiltonian has a gap, spectral gap? And here is completely obvious because they are all local projectors Hermitian, and then they can be all diagonalized simultaneously. So therefore, obviously you have a spectral gap. 
And uh, I will also talk about gapped fractal models, but uh, most of the time I will, if I have time, I will focus on uh, non you know, fractal cases. And then the question I have is, uh, you know, you have such kind of Hamiltonians. Like I really want to call them Hamiltonian schema, which means it's not a single Hamiltonian, you know, it depends on the lattice. Uh, so you want to take some kind of limit and you want to ask, you know, what happens if the size of the lattice, you know, goes to zero? And what I want is a, a topological quantum field theory, which I can make more precise later. And uh, I actually, I believe, uh, you want the chiral ones, uh, if they are stable in the sense that the Hilbert space, no degeneracy on the sphere, and then uh, they can always be realized by gapped models, but uh, the local projector might not commute with each other, they better not actually. Also, uh, the lattice might not be arbitrary in the sense like, you know, you have to use like, a, you know, Hagner's lattice, some kind of structure. And the reason is in reality, the model we have is too uh, liberal and it can be written down for any lattice. But we know for material science, the lattice cannot be arbitrary. You know, you can have Kagami lattice, square lattice, you know, all kinds of special lattices. So I believe if, if we drop the local projector have to commute and if the lattice can be, you know, have some special form, we should be able to realize all the, uh, uh, you know, all the two plus one two KFTs. But the trouble is that once you drop all the local term commute, and uh, there are very limited, almost none, you know, powerful tools mathematically to show there's a spectral gap. And the physicists normally just run computers, uh, sometimes convincing, most times it's not, because by the very definition of those things, uh, it's impossible for classical computer to simulate. So, so that's the basic question I want to address. And uh, the solution I will talk about today is all form, you know, fall into commuting projectors. And uh, the reason not commuting are hard is, as I said, you know, we just don't know if they have spectral gaps. So, so that's the general uh, assumption I will make. So unless I would say uh, the Hamiltonian always consisting of local commuting projectors. And uh, so that's the subject I want to make. So when, uh, you know, kind of we start to think about this, we were all very confused by this question because by the very definition of a weighted turn Simon theory, we know the Hamiltonian is zero. So how could you even write down a lattice Hamiltonian to realize TKFT? It took some time for, uh, at least for me to appreciate. So the problem is not about TKFT directly in a sense. The Hamiltonian is for the underlying particle systems. And for physicists, it's very obvious this is the case. Really what it is is that, you know, most obvious top particle physics matter fractal quantum power liquid. The Hamiltonian is not for the anions. The Hamiltonian is for the electrons. So really you are write down a particle system that they emerged or the ground states really form a top particle quantum field theory. And uh, it's also not quite true that Hamiltonian zero, the theory is trivial. That's not completely true either. Because if you think about Hamiltonian equals zero, that's analogous to a function has a derivative equals zero. But a function derivative equals zero still can be very interesting if the domain of the function is not connected. So at least, you can have different constants for different kinetic components. And that's actually more or less, you know, what this within trans theory is. You know, if you think about all these gradients, it's basically a kind of, you know, function value of a different kinetic components. So finally, when we understood this question and, uh, you know, we start to think about how to do this, uh, especially if we want to do mathematically, and I should have said that, you know, for our quantum hole, there are lots of uh, physical Hamiltonians like this, but uh, it's far from clear they fulfilled all the uh, properties we wanted. So two earlier attempt of this problem is one is written by a paper by Michael Friedman, so-called, I don't know if you can, real, you can read the, the title, it's called localization of modular functors. And uh, he kind of, 
uh, you know, he wrote down something, but I don't think he completely appreciate the difficulty, which is anything you wrote down, there's something really strange. It seemed to be doubled automatically. And uh, that's actually related to another paper, which uh, I wrote with uh, quite a few authors, which kind of like my first relatively physical paper, which is, uh, it seems like the Hamiltonian have something doubled in it if you write them down on the plane. So, so this is some phenomena I have a lot of appreciation, but I wouldn't say I completely understood, you know, what's the, the problem. So, uh, so that's actually the two earliest attempts. I don't consider this as a solution. And then uh, Michael Friedman, Chet and I, and I we uh, organize a workshop. Uh, I think this is probably the first modern workshop on topology in condensed matter physics. And uh, so that's actually you know, American Institute of Mathematics. And uh, during that workshop, I think uh, Michael Lewin kind of first made his name, which is uh, he was working with Xiao Gang on the famous Lewin model. So uh, that's actually what the highlight came out of this you know, workshop. And uh, so after that, uh, I think um, Lewin and uh, Xiao Gang wrote down this famous Lewin Wen model uh, to realize the triple viral TKFTs. And actually, in retrospect, you know, Kitaifi already did this for the diagraph weighting theory already. It's just that, uh, at least for me, I didn't appreciate, you know, this, uh, the importance of those things uh, for condensed matter physics. So uh, after that, uh, you know, Kevin Walker and, uh, you know, I, you know, we had some general understanding about the subject in the sense that, you know, really the theory is that, you know, if you can write down some state, some top particle quantum field theory using some very heavy algebra, you know, it's called a unitary N category, even the definition is not completely settled. And then in principle, uh, there is a way to write down a lattice Hamiltonian model. What I said in principle is that the difficulty is not, you know, completely uh, trivial. Uh, there are really interesting subtleties. So basically uh, the, the models we have all follow this principle, which is you write down state sum and then you try to write down a realistic, at least theoretically realistic lattice Hamiltonian model, you know, for this TPFT. I should have said, you know, I used the word realize, it's not completely accurate either. Uh, there are no doubts, you know, those things, they do realize the right top particle quantum field theory, but uh, I would not agree that for, you know, several of those, there is a mathematical proof this is the case. Uh, it's just that the formulation is really a little bit complicated, but I have no doubt, you know, they do realize the corresponding top particle quantum field theory. So, so that's, uh, you know, kind of came out of the uh, workshop and uh, the direct motivation for me to write down the model actually came from uh, this 3D top particle insulators. Excuse so me. This thought, I definitely believe they are top particle physical matter. So I start to think, you know, how to capture them using top particle quantum field theories. Excuse and, me, Tim. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah, go I, ahead. I wonder, can we, uh, could we sharpen the statement earlier, the interesting statement you make about the doubling? Yeah. Uh, saying that uh, when you try to construct some maybe latest Hamiltonian model for uh, low energy with TQFT, somehow the theories double in some way. Uh, for example, in it's useful discussion, may, may not be easy to sharpen the statement. For example, uh, last week, uh, when Xiaogang gave a talk on this chiral fermion, there is a statement uh, for the chiral fermion theory. Basically, uh, this statement is the Nielsen Neomia theorem. And it says that uh, in even dimensional space time, uh, when the system, uh, the low line un underlying Hamiltonian is non interacting, uh, then when you look at the energy spectrum, if there are chiral fermions, then there must be also the doubling, which uh, chirality is opposite. So that's a statement maybe one can sharpen uh, to say this statement. Although the attempt of the Xiaogang's toe is trying to uh, in include in interaction and such that uh, in certain uh, fully perturbative local and non-perturbative global non-free theory, the chiral fermions 
uh, might, might still be uh, appear in the spectrum without the doubling. But, but in the original statement, Nielsen email, it's a, there's a sharp statement say that in which condition uh, there's a doubling spectrum. And I wonder whether the, the doubling you mentioned has, has some also statement that you can make maybe more mathematical in which condition that uh, there's, there's some doubling like chiral, if they are, if the theory put on manifold responded, they are chiral modes, then they are anti-chiral modes. Maybe they, maybe they are related, but uh, I don't know whether, whether there's some statement you want to make to make. Uh you observe there. Yeah, just... okay. uh, uh, you know, first I should say, I just don't understand uh, this, you know, chiral Fermi problem, but, you know, at least, you know, philosophically, they seem to be related. But I, I you know, uh, let me talk, not talk about fermions. Let me uh, say another, I can, you know, I kind of a believe. So uh, I think, you know, this kind of double, uh, phenomena. Uh, it says something, but not necessarily. Uh, this is the showstopper in the following sense. Uh, you know, I will mention this later on. Uh, I firmly believe that you know the model Holden wrote down many years ago, uh, which is a non-commuting projector Hamiltonian, will realize the semia, which is a chiral theory. And also, I do believe you know the Kitaev of Honeycomb model for the Eisen theory which also realize a chiral theory. So you don't have to double, but as I said earlier, the price you pay is, it's not commuting, which you have to have. And then the lattice is always highly uh, constrained. In the Hodin model is the Honeycomb lattice model, and in GitHub it's roughly the same. So uh, I don't know how much you can sharpen, but I definitely think uh, there are ways to realize those kind of a chiral theory, even in the bosonic sense. Uh, you might be able to uh, do the same for fermions. Uh, I just, I just don't. Uh, you know, fermions are really hard for me to think because they are realistic. So, uh, so, but I, I, I think there is a way to sharpen the statement. But I just don't know how. Thank so, you, Yeah. Uh, so, which model holding are you talking about? Uh, the, uh, I think this is the uh, nearest, uh, next nearest neighborhood on the Honeycomb lattice. I think it's the, uh, some special J1, J2. Uh, this is written down, mentioned in the paper I wrote with uh, uh, Leon Balance and uh, Hong Chen for the, you know, top ranking tank of entropy calculation. And uh, it's on the Honeycomb lattice with nearest, uh, I think the next nearest neighborhood interaction. And uh, if you pick the right coupling coefficient and uh, Widow and his graduate student, or post I forgot, calculated the ST matrix. They are definitely the ST matrix of Semion up to the precision of a 10 to the negative third. So I have no doubt that's a realization. I see, because usually you know, we think about this Holding's model of Three fermions on honeycomb lattice, which realize a trend insulator. But that's not, not the one that you have in mind. No, no, that's not the one I mean. That's the enormous hole. That's the different one. This is a, I, I think you can you can get all the parameters in the paper I mentioned, uh, the one I wrote with the uh, Leon balance. Okay. And right. so we use that model to test the top argument time with entropy calculation. But uh, I think the most exciting thing for me is the, the numerical simulation the uh, Giffrey Widow did with his postdoc. Uh, the ST matrix just beautifully agree with Samia. Okay, so uh, so I, I definitely have no doubt, you know, this can be sharpened in some way, but uh, I think the, the things definitely I believe you have to draw up is a commuting projector and the model can be written down or any lattice. I think that's just too liberal. Uh, so now I want to say the direct motivation for me to, uh, to write down the model uh, for the creator. That's actually, uh, it's because of 3D topological insulator. So I start to think, you know, uh, how to capture those use topological quantum field theory. And there are two random paper for me, actually. I was aware of the paper of Shou Chong on spin uh, hole. He mentioned the, uh, the paper which I wrote with other people, the PT environment topological physics. 
And then uh, I was impressed by the paper of uh, Joe and his graduate student, Bill. And I know people think there's a problem with this paper, but uh, physically. Uh, but anyway, this gave me the uh, motivation and to think about this question. And uh, then uh, Xiu Cheng was organizing a special issue and uh, the journal Frontiers Physics in China want to change the title to Frontiers in Physics. Uh, Frontier Physics dropped in China. So he uh, organized a special issue and he invited me to write an article. So that's why I uh, really worked with Kevin. And uh, so I wrote this, uh, you know, we wrote this paper uh, which appeared. And later I realized uh, most people didn't follow the invitation. Uh, most people wrote survey articles. I think I was one of the very few who submitted a real research uh, paper. So, so that's actually uh, you know, the direct motivation because you know, after the discussion about the lemon wing model or something, we have some general understanding of those kind of things. So uh, this uh, topological incident gave me a directly motivation to write down something uh, very concrete in particularly uh, I intended for physicists. So I wrote the way uh, much more physical than a mathematical paper. So, so that's the kind of uh, my uh, kind of uh, answer to uh, Jimwin's question about you know, where this model came from. And uh, so now I will spend a few slides to summarize you know, uh, some other things related. So uh, I think the uh, analog of level one model in three plus one is still not quite work out. So uh, the model I have with Kevin is just a small part. And then uh, my former student, Sean, uh, you know, wrote down some other three plus one TKFTs and uh, uh, Meng Chung's uh, former postal, uh, Williamson, uh, he uh, and I wrote down some Hamiltonian to realize some of those. And we have trouble with the G cross is non-abelian. And then I think the right uh, generalization of a trifle viral is given by Douglas, Chris Douglas and the Reuter. And I think a Hamiltonian realization of the Douglas Reuter three plus one to KFT would be the corresponding lemon one in three plus one. But this is really, I think the right notion of a spherical two category. So, uh, so I think there are still interesting things to be done here. There are many interesting things. So at least this one seems to be the closest, which is a three plus one most general framework to generalize the lemon win. And uh, there are some other very interesting model. If I have a time, I will cover, which is this so-called gapped fracton. Uh, not necessarily I will do, uh, it depends on time. So, so that's what I know. And uh, there are some interesting applications of the model. Uh, and uh, the one which surprised me the most is the recent one that uh, Lukas, uh, Zhu Wang and Matt Hasting used the model to construct a 3D QCA called quantum cellular automata. And quantum cellular automata is a horrible, horrible name. And uh, it really should be called locality preserving uh, automorphism. It's basically some uh, local algebra and you want a locality preserving uh, automorphism. So uh, that's actually, uh, the reason I mentioned this paper first, it surprised me, uh, it used to construct a non-trivial uh, QCA. The second thing was, you know, uh, the model I wrote down, uh, you know, for physicists, so, so many years, nobody cared other than the three torus. Uh, this is the first time uh, they still they start to ask me how do you write down the model on a general three manifold. Uh, it is a highly non-trivial question. So after I prepare the talk, most try to outline, you know, more than the paper. But uh, we will see uh, if I can get uh, a lot of detail of this. So so that's actually there are some other applications. Uh, okay. So uh, actually, uh, before I continue, uh, any questions? Because uh, I consider this is the most you know, abstract uh, part of the talk, which is uh, I just want to give you some you know, kind of historical uh, notes on, on the model. Any question before I continue? So uh, if you don't, so let me start to uh, tell you, you know, how I think about this general thing. Uh, so first I want to uh, 
remind people who don't, uh, you know, well, who are not mathematicians, how mathematicians are thinking about top particle quantum field theory. So uh, the most standard way uh, to think about top particle quantum field theory is given by Atia. Uh, so uh, follow the formulation by Siegel on conformal field theory. So the way you do it is if you use the mathematical language, you take your space manifold and space time manifolds, one as you know, the, the space manifolds as an object, the space time manifolds as bodies, which are morphism of a category. And then a TKFT is just a symmetric monoidal functor from this category of space and space time to the category of a finite dimensional vector spaces. And uh, so we can define this whole thing as one sentence, but the difficulty is hidden in the word symmetric monoidal functor. So if you don't use this language and you can just write down exactly what it means by axioms. So that's what I did for the later part. So if you have not seen this definition before, I just remind you the important you know, things. One is if you have a theory which is n plus one, that means the space dimension is n, the space time dimension is n plus one. And then the theory should give you a Hilbert space or vector space more general for every space manifold. And for every space time, and now it's more general than a cylinder. And uh, this considered to be a bodism. So there are two boundaries. There's an input boundary, there's an output boundary. And then this morphism, this bodism will give you a linear map for the two vector spaces you already associate to the input and output. And uh, to be more restrictive, I want this TKFT to be stable in the sense that the Hilbert space you associate to the space and sphere is one dimensional. So that's the actual condition I will put in. And then there's the obvious things come from quantum mechanics. If the space manifolds are destroying union, you get tensor product. If the space manifold get reversed from orientation, you get a dual vector space. If the morphism is the cylinder, there are no top particle change. So there are no non-trivial evolution. And then the most difficult one is the gluing of morphism or bodism. And if you have two bodism from X1 to, from Y1 to Y2, and then Y2, Y3, if you glue them together and the linear map, they assigned uh, differently should compose to give you the gluing one. But sometimes there's a subtlety so-called anomaly, which I think I will uh, say more later. And uh, so that's the other subtlety about TKFT. And then uh, the whole Hamiltonian realization of top particle quantum field theory just means that I want to write down a Hamiltonian schema so that the ground state would realize this Hilbert space Vy for all space manifolds Y. So that's what we want to do. And it turns out this kind of TKFT, uh, I don't know how to write them down. So at least I want the TKFT to be one extended. Excuse so me, Jennifer. one extend yeah. So in your axioms, there's no unitarity, right? You haven't put any Hilbert structure on the vector space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's why right now it's a vector space. So the one I need to realize should be unitary top particle quantum field theory. Okay. And uh, then the vector space become a Hilbert space. And uh, there are some extra axiom actually, I didn't put them down. Uh, I think you can find in my monograph. Uh, the, the thing, what you need to, uh, is not completely trivial. The point is that, uh, if you want to think about vector space, orientation reversing just give you the dual vector space. But if you want a Hermitian structure, you don't just have a dual, you have a dagger. And those two has to be compatible to get a unitary theory. So uh, I won't really uh, you know, uh, go to the details because I don't think my presentation will go that you're absolutely right. So the way I wrote down everything right now, it's not unitary. And that's it's like reflection. Kept... Yeah, that's reflection positivity. I think that's it. It is. Uh, 
So, okay. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant uh, for the reason, you know, I, I know, well, I heard about refraction positivity, but I, my understanding that's actually is for Euclidean signature. And uh, so there is something which I also find kind of a puzzling is that top part of quantum field theory somehow automatically seems to be, you know, relativistic or something uh, in the sense that, you know, you require antiparticles, but I definitely believe reflection positivity and unitarity either are the same or close related. You can translate one to the other, uh, but I'm not hundred percent sure they're exactly the same. Tension, okay, so May I yeah. ask a quick question, clarification? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, why here? So, why is uh, is n-dimensional space correct? Yeah, n-dimensional space. Yes. Right. And so, how should I think of the third axiom? Is that like inverting the orientation of that space? What does minus y mean in the third oh, axiom? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, so, uh, this is actually a, a, a great question. Uh, orientation actually. You know, most people would, uh, okay, so let me first say, you know, what I really like to start, uh, unfortunately that's not how mathematicians do, is I want to think about non-oriented manifolds. And, uh, but then, uh, you know, they are too special. There are very few, uh, you know, like Tory code actually can be defined for non-orientable spaces. So uh, let me to be specific in two plus one dimension. So then why would be a surface? And uh, you want you want to ask the question, you know, why when I assign the Hilbert space to the surface, I need an orientation at all. And the minus y just means that, uh, you know, you reverse the orientation. And it seemed to be the following uh, subtle phenomena, which is, as I said earlier, somehow top part of quantum field theory seem to be automatically relativistic. So that means, you can create particles and antiparticles. And uh, we have this kind of relativistic thinking that a particle go backwards in time should be considered the antiparticle. Mm -hmm. And that's actually introduced orientation into it. So in a sense, if you think about this physical phenomena, say, oh, I have any uh, on this two dimensional space. And actually for the most subtle theory, that's you know, you need an extra piece of information to encode this anion trajectory. You need to have something like, is this anion would go forward in time or backward in time? And that's actually uh, a piece of information you cannot ignore. And for those who know the graphic calculus, so if you really do the most general graphic calculus, you would know that Trayev in his book it's formulated as, okay, you take a fixed time and then you label a point by an objects. And if you reverse the object, you will get the antiparticle. But if you really think harder, actually, not only you label by a, a object of the category, actually you label by both an object with a plus or minus sign. And that's actually this extra plus or minus sign besides this arrow is something you have to use to encode the Frobenius show indicator. So, so that's a subtlety, actually this orientation uh, is important for the most uh, you know, subtle theories in the subject. But in general, uh, you, know, uh, you don't need the orientation, but uh, this, this is actually, so physically, as I said, it just means that it seems like uh, the theory is very sensitive to that if you have your space manifold, you actually need a little bit of normal direction of the manifold, which is, is this manifold, which side would go to the future and which side will be coming from for you know, the past. And that's this uh, orientation is important for. I so I hope, yeah. And if it's non-orientable, then what do you do? Oh, uh, there are theories which can be defined for non-orientable manifold, like Tory code. 
but most of the theory cannot be defined from non-readable manifolds. Oh, I hear you. So, so this specific one is assuming that Y is orientable. Yeah, I assume Y is orientable. Uh, I think I must, I hope, you know, uh, the, okay. So maybe this will answer your question faster, which is uh, there are all kinds of variations of theory. And there are theories which your manifolds are all oriented. And there are theories which the manifolds are oriented. And we will see actually even for transformal theory, that's not sufficient. The theory has to be framed. So uh, there are very few which can be defined for non-orientable manifolds, all of them. And but the standard choice is for oriented. So for example, uh, you know, for a theory like SU2 level two, and we don't know without further you know, generalization how to write down the Hilbert space for RP2, which is now orientable. And so, so that's, so, but we do know how to write down for the two sphere and with orientation. So, so I hope that's, that's what bothers you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so I, I want to say that, you know, uh, the one which standard RTI type is not the one I, you know, people can realize or I can realize using uh, lattice Hamiltonians. And those has to be further extended. And I don't want to extend all the way. So I want to at least extend one more dimension. So, which is, uh, I want to think about manifold space dimension N, space time N plus one, and then I want to think of one more dimension lower, which is n minus one manifolds. And for two plus one, that would be one dimension, one manifold, two manifold, three manifolds. And that's actually uh, would require some further axioms. And uh, those are the three, uh, there are many more, but those are the most three, uh, the three most important ones, uh, which basically capture, uh, I would say, you know, all the, the kind of physical things, you know, people usually think. So the first axiom is called a disk axiom, which is that if you want to assign a Hilbert space to a disk, and because disk has a boundary and the boundary needs some boundary condition. And uh, it's part of the axiom that the boundary condition is in one one correspondence with any types, which is not completely trivial actually. Uh, an anion is a, uh, you know, kind of a pointed excitation. So it really should be think like a puncture, but this is a, a you know, a finite sized boundary. So this is one of the axiom that the boundary excitation corresponds one one with the particle type. And then the disk axiom says there would be no non-trivial things on the disk unless the boundary condition is trivial, which means no excitation, no matter how big the disk is. Uh, that's the disk axiom. And then the annulus axiom says, if you have an annulus or a cylinder, you have two boundaries and they have labels, and this won't be able to support any state unless A and B are dual particle. And this is actually the orientation comes in. So this, you should consider the annulus as the evolution of a circle. And then the induced orientation on the two boundaries are opposite. So that's why they are considered antiparticle of each pair. So, so the first axiom says disk cannot support a tau particle state unless the boundary condition is trivial. The annular says that the annulus cannot support a tau particle state unless the anions are dual to each other. Another way to say it is this is no tau particle change of the anions if no tau particle change, because if you think about this as evolution, of a non-local excitation on the boundary, it just says the evolution won't change this top particle property because the annulus has no top particle change. And then the gluing axiom is a top particle way to encode the locality. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the axiom is a formula in the following way, which is uh, if you take a surface, I take the one two plus, two plus one dimension. If you take a surface, you cut along a loop, and then the Hilbert space for the one before become direct sum over 
when you cut, you get two more boundary components. And then these two more com boundary components will be labeled by anion and anti-anions. And you have to go through all the possibilities and then add them together. Uh, actually, if you think about Hilbert space and the direct sum has no canonical uh, you know, sum for Hilbert space, so you would say, oh yeah, I just take a over n, but that's not a good sum of Hilbert space. It turns out this summation is also uh, determined by the axiom, which is the norm is given by a weighted sum and the weighted sum actually is the quantum dimension normalized. So, so that's the three axioms uh, which you have to uh, introduce if uh, you want to think about Hamiltonian realizations. So this is, I call this one extended TKFT, there are some other axioms. So those are the TKFT, uh, at least I want to realize. And uh, so now I want to just quickly, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, whether the boundary for the disk or annulus, you require to be gap or gapless? Uh, at this point, there are no discussion about gap or gapless because I'm not talking about Hamiltonian realization yet. But uh, in the end, that's actually is the case. Uh, if for those who know the theory, we know now that you could choose different boundary conditions. So all it says is that, you know, if you think about topological physical matter and it's supposed gap to boundary, and you ask, you know, what's the possible way to label the, the boundary? And the boundary would be a module of the thing, you know, the, the, the bulk thing. And uh, this is the case you choose the boundary to be the trivial module, which is the category itself. But in this axiom, there are no discussion about gap to boundary. It just says that if you do a one extended top particle quantum field theory, and uh, the boundaries also need some algebraic data, and the data is uh, the same as any other types. So, so this is just the two plus one version uh, of you know what Moore, Seinberg, and later formulated by Walker and Trayev. So, just make sure the capital C here means uh, complex. Oh, the, the capital C is a complex number. I just, uh, I think for those who know category, they, you might want to think of the category. No, no, that's not category. That's a complex number. Thanks. So it just says that. With the boundary condition, with the boundary is trivial, you can support only one state, so it's one dimensional. Okay, so so the, this part I think I I will do it fast because I assume people all know you know this kind of physics. So uh, the mathematical model of anions is unitary module tensor category. So uh, I won't really uh, it's just assertion. I don't think there's anything. Uh, to prove here, uh, I think the best proof would be uh, experiments. Uh, so we don't know. So, uh, and then uh, I also won't really go to a lot uh, about this you know, discussion about, you know, what is an anion model? And I want to flash a slide just to, uh, for those who have not seen this. So there's a well-developed mathematical theory of an anion model. And uh, in basically all, it happened was a sharpening of the paper of Moore and Seiberg, the famous classical and the quantum conformal field theory, and remove all the redundancies and bring out all the explicit assumptions. And then you will get a notion of a module tensor category. And for any ions, uh, you need unitary. So there's a way to define unitarity. So basically what it is, is uh, you have an anion universe, you label all the possible anion types, including the vacuum, and then you describe how they fuse together, and uh, they how to recouple uh, using the six symbols, and they how to breathe them each other. Uh, there's a subtlety about, you know, how to define the quantum dimension. So that's the epsilon i. And then there's a bunch of consistencies, which are pentagon hexagons, and uh, that will give you a, a full data of the anion model. And then you can translate back and forth uh, in terms of, you know, what is an anion in mathematical language? I would say just a simple object. So I just took this out of my uh, monograph too. So there is a uh, well-developed mathematical model of anion system, 
which is called a unitary module tensor category. And uh, those are all very complicated objects, but uh, it's well studied for the last 15, 20 years. And there are a few uh, important numbers in an annual system. So that's what I want to uh, use them again and again. So first is the label set. Uh, this is basically uh, the collection of any types in your universe. If you think about QED, this is like, you know, your universe has three things, vacuum, electrons, and photons. Uh, this is more or less the same kind of things. And then every annual has a quantum dimension. And the physical definition is, the quantum dimension is you start with a vacuum, you bring out of the vacuum a pair of those annuals, the anti annual and then fuse it back to the vacuum and the amplitude of this process is the quantum dimension. And it's always a positive uh, real number. And for unitary theories, it's a positive real number at least one. And then there's a topological twist, which you can also define using physical process to say you start with a vacuum, you bring out two pair of anions, you break the middle two, and then you annihilate them. You ask what's the amplitude for this process to go to the vacuum, both the pair, and you divide it by the quantum dimension before, and that's a number. And turns out for any model, not only this is a number, this is a root of unity by a theorem due to uh, Wafa. And then, uh, so these are the so-called quantum dimension of a twist of anions, and uh, the important numerical you know, environment of the anion model is this D square, which is take your, all your anion types, take the quantum dimension then square it. And uh, that's a very important number. Uh, this is basically, in my analogy, the anion model is like a finite group. Uh, this will be basically uh, the number of elements of your finite group is the order of the group. So, so that's those quantity. And then another important thing is that you can also define the amplitude of bring two pairs of different anions, you braid them a full braiding, and then annihilate them, ask them amplitude. And that's a, a number depends on uh, the anion type A and B, and you can form a matrix. And then if you combine with the matrix before about the top particle twist, make it diagonal and uh, those two matrices form a projective representation of the modular group. It's not really the module, the double of the modular group, the, the two full cover. So, so those are the so-called modular data of a modular tensor category. And there are some other data, which is 6G symbols, which are the F matrices. Uh, I took this out of my monograph again. And uh, so this is the way I think I, I don't know exactly. So present the whole data if you want to do a cal graph calculus for any other theory. So, uh, you know, those are just well-developed, very complicated theories. So now I want to formulate uh, the general philosophy, you know, how this will work for all the models. So uh, all the models we know have this follow structure. So you start with a finite label set, and then you take your space manifold are you represented by some complex? So at the moment, we just do two complex. And then uh, you attach each of the edge of these two complex a Q date. And uh, many cases, you have to care about the vertices. But let me, for simplicity, you know, not bother with the so called multiplicity. And then you get a Hilbert space. And uh, the way I think about it is like, you think about your complex as a real material, and then you have the uh, site or the vertices, you think that's like a, an atom or something. And then the edges just tells you how those atoms interact with each other. And they just need to write down a Hamiltonian uh, for this material. And the way we learn from, uh, you know, Kitab's Tori code, uh, the level one model is that there are general two kinds of terms. One is that for each vertex, you enforce some kind of a Gauss law, which is a fusion rule. And then for each plaquette, you enforce some kind of a zero flux. And uh, 
that's basically uh, the general structure of this Hamiltonian. It's always two kinds of terms, the uh, vertex term, which enforce the fusion rule, and then the plaque term for some kind of zero flux. And then um, I would define that a Hamiltonian schema realize a top particle quantum field theory as that you take your two complex, you write down your Hamiltonian, and uh, they have a well-defined ground state because this is a gap thing. And then you get a map from Y, your space manifolds to this ground state of the Hamiltonian. And uh, if the dependence of the ground state on the two complex and the Hamiltonian are factorial, and uh, that will make this map into a, a top particle quantum field theory. And then I would declare you realize the top particle quantum field theory by this Hamiltonian schema. I use the word schema to mean it's not a single Hamiltonian. It's just a recipe to write down lots of Hamiltonians once you are given the data like a K. So, so that's what I call a, you know, a realization of a top particle quantum field theory. And uh, the vertex term is completely trivial. It's always the same thing. So the difficulty is the plaquette term. So where the plaquette term comes from, uh, that's actually really come from the gluing axiom. Uh, this is a lot of mathematics. So I won't really, you know, I just want to tell you where they come from. Uh, the implementation can be very difficult. So what it really is, it's the following. So if you think about a two complex, uh, there are vertices, there are edges, and then there are faces. So the vertices and the edges, you should consider them if you are topologies as the zero one handles. And that's, you know, you easily figure out the ground state of those fusion rules. And then you want to further cut down the, uh, you know, the Hamiltonian of the Plaquette term. What that means, you attach two handles. And then when you attach a two handle, if your top particle quantum field theory is fully extended, and then there will be gluing formulas for manifolds with boundaries or with corners. And then those gluing formula tells you how to get the ground state or the Hilbert space in the TKFT when you finish all the gluing of two handles. And that's actually uh, can be in, pra in principle be written down as uh, local terms. And that's basically the structure of all the kind of you know, beautiful commuting Hamiltonian come from is these two things, fusion rod vertices, and then the plaquette are the two handles. So basically all the theory we will write down follow this principle. Uh, this is start with Kitayev on the Tory code, except he didn't really use this complicated language. He directly tell you the answer using poly matrices. So the, now you can see that the vertex term is completely trivial, just fusion rule. And you just said that if you have three label around a vertex, if you don't follow the fusion rule, you give them a high energy. And if they follow the fusion rule, you make them in the ground state. So the difficulty is the second term, the plaquette term. And the implementation of the plaquette term using a very important thing inside your algebraic category called the Kirby color. And basically that's the, key, that's the key to all the lattice model. Every theory has a Kirby color. And what it is, is a very trivial thing. is just a formal summation of all your anions in your theory weighted by the quantum dimension. And then normalized by one over the order of your category, which is D squared. So, so that's called a Kirby color. If you write out this formal sum, there's no point, just something. But why is it important? So uh, it's called Kirby color for a reason. So uh, for those, this is a total different community. So Kirby is Robin Kirby. He's a topologist uh, at Berkeley. He's basically the father, the modern father of low dimension topology in America. And uh, so it's called Kirby color is because this is the key to define the three manifold environment in Rishkin triad theory. So uh, Kirby have this Kirby calculus, which tells you you can represent the three manifolds by frame links. And then uh, the same three manifolds 
uh, will, you know, if two links represent the same three manifold, they can be handle slide one to the other. Uh, this Kirby color is the magic uh, decoration that if you do handle slide, the topological environment associated to a link is still the same. So that's what, uh, why it's called a Kirby color. But for this subject of Hamiltonian, the important property is the following. So if you think about the graphic calculus, if you take a n naught, and then there's another n go through, and if this n naught is labeled by the Kirby color, uh, then by easy calculation, you would see that this uh, link or graph formally would be zero unless the I, which is the annual type, is the vacuum, which equals zero. And for those who know the S matrix, and this requires the S matrix to be non-singular. And then if you just write down this formal summation, you will see this just means that the S matrix is unitary because this says it's just the first column or the first row, it doesn't matter. It's the first row is perpendicular uh, to every other rows. So unless i equals zero, which is the same thing as the first row, you get a non-zero number. Otherwise they are perpendicular. So this is basically the key to all the Hamiltonian you write down. The plaquette, the plaquette term is just a rewrite of this identity. So, so this is the Kirby color. And uh, if you want to write down the concrete formula using the Kirby color, and I directly copy from my monograph again. So if you think about the Hilbert space, it's always generated by trivalent graph with some labels. And then for each plaquette, you will write on a term like, you know, what I did here is that you think you put your Kirby color, you pick a face or a plaquette, you imagine your Kirby color is a loop inside this face. And uh, then formally just expand this. So that means some summation with a loop labeled by an anion. And then this anion would be, uh, you know, I will show you the next slide, generate an operator. So that's the formula for the plaquette term. But then, you know, you want to think backwards. If you think about before you do this whole mass of rewrite, and you have a omega loop inside the plaquette. By the very definition of a graph calculus, that can be shrunk away with equal nothing, just one. So therefore, if you are inside the ground state, this formula just implement that this projector equals one. And then if you think about the projection property, so that means this projector exactly enforced, there are no flux, topological flux go through that plaquette. So that's the logic between, you know, that's the logic behind, you know, the Kirby color is basically the only thing which is important to enforce the uh, zero flux of a plaquette. And the way to write down, this is also directly copied from my monograph. And you can just say, okay, I have a loop in the middle of a plaquette and I can, can do some, uh, you know, uh, kind of really, you know, rewrite. I can take this loop, pick a point and then try to fuse to the edge. And then I go through this whole process and I get a very complicated com you know, uh, expression using 60 symbols. And that would be the concrete term for the plaquette. And uh, this is pretty much uh, all the model in two dimensions, including the level one model is generated this way, although it's not presented in this way. So uh, the subtlety is that uh, for the most general theory, you need also to label the trivalent vertices because there are multiplicity in fusion. And the edges also need an arrow. And that's actually because the particle might not be self dual And then there's a one more subtlety, which is the edges might not be horizontal. And that has to do with the Frobenius show indicator. So if you take care of those three things, and then uh, all the models in two dimension is just uh, you know uh, a generalization of this philosophy, and uh, if you really only work on the double of Tori code, you know actually the Tori code itself is is okay actually uh, not even the double 
Tori code, just the Tori code. And they're using and the fit double using double Fibonacci. And uh, you can ignore the subtleties because those all don't arrive for those theory. And now basically this is how I would say, you know, the uh, the model I have with uh, Kelvin is basically to generalize this to three dimension. And now uh, we have one more, at least one more subtlety, which you have to deal with the braiding and the twist. And this is also a, a resolution of that into plus one dimension. The Hamiltonian only realized the double theories. You want to ask, you know, what happened to the chiral ones, the one with non-zero central charge, or more precisely, they are not doubles. And I still don't know how to resolve that issue, but we can deal with them in one dimension higher. So that's the model which I, you know, I uh, had with Kelvin, uh, which is another way to say the chiral ones can be realized one dimension higher. So uh, just remind you the framing anomaly. So uh, if you really want to be very precise, you know, in a sense, the weight and turn Simon theory does not quite fit into the axiom I give you because they are not defined for oriented manifolds and they are defined for so-called framed three manifolds. So a framing means that the three manifolds, the tangent bundle not only is trivial, and the tangent bundle has to be given a very specific way to make it trivial. So a homotopy class of a trivialization of the tangent bundle, that's a framing. And uh, that's actually your original written paper. I think RTR realized you don't need to be that strong. You don't need to trivialize the tangent bundle. You can trivialize two copies of the tangent bundle. That's enough. So that's called a two framing. And then Walker uh, suggested, you know, following a suggestion by Andrew Casson, says, you know, the two framing can be formulated in another way. Okay, that's the wrong state. It's not formula. It's a can be replaced by another, they're not completely equivalent, can be form, you know, can be uh, replaced by a signature of a bounding four manifold. So, so that's actually uh, the issue with uh, not doubled two plus one top particle quantum field theory. And then to uh, resolve this framing, I still think it's possible to do in two dimension, but I don't know how to do it. So uh, what I would say is that the model I have with Kevin give you a three plus one dimension resolution of this framing thing, which is we can write out the model, uh, you know, take care of, of those which have non-zero central charge or uh, not doubles. So, uh, so that's actually the general uh, kind of you know discussion on how to write down this kind of Hamiltonian models. So now I want to uh, talk about the specific model which is the uh, uh, realization of a Cranietta two QFTs. And uh, I realize actually there's a lot of topology here. Uh, I could, you know, go the path of doing the physics way of examples, but I think my focus actually is on the general three manifold. So I will uh, do the general mathematical theory. I know it's very heavy for not topologies, but I think it's, uh, it's better to, uh, you know, to give you the, the, the full picture that, you know, uh, some special cases. So, uh, so first I want to define the three plus one top particle quantum field theory. So this is indeed, you know, fill in, you know, fill uh, the ITR definition and there's no anomaly or anything. So the input is either an NER model or it could be slide general, which is uh, the S matrix can be degenerate. And that's called a pre-modular category. And then uh, we can write down three plus one TQFT. This is exactly Cranietta did in a sense, but not really what they did exactly. They only wrote down the partition function or the invariant. But to go from the invariant to a TQFT in this setup is not uh, hard at all. So uh, if the input it's not degenerate. So that means a true annual model. I think the theory is almost trivial, which means that for the space three manifolds, the Hilbert space is always one dimensional and the partition function or the four manifold environment is always a homotopy environment. But still interesting, which kind of surprised me is that, you know, when I wrote out the model, I thought, okay, 
maybe the non-modular one is very interesting because there's some residual top particle uh, thing. But it turns out it's this trivial case, which is most interesting to physicists because it's kind of trivial and then you can think about symmetry. And as I you know, also learned later, uh, this top particle insulator, insulator is you know, should be regarded as symmetry protected. So, so that's actually turns out to be a surprise to me that this is the most interesting case, which is almost trivial. So, you know, uh, yeah. Sorry, may I ask just, um, so from somebody who's not familiar with your, in the details with your work with Walker, um, how, uh, so is there any condition on what kind of the three manifolds you're considering? So it seems no. like the, the is so is the go, mm -hmm, go on. So the answer is uh, the the model is supposed to work for every oriented closed three manifold. I see, and that's a way of so this unitary crane yetter or what you did with Mike is a way of kind of using this one dimension higher three plus one dimensional TQFT to then generate the desired anion model. Should I think of it like that? So, so you know, you gave me as an input the anion model that you would like in 2 plus 1D. And then the prescription is to try to come up with something which is defined on 3 plus 1 dimensional manifold. And you're saying it doesn't matter what kind of manifold that is, as long as it's oriented. Is that correct? Okay, no, that, that's actually, uh, okay. So there are two ways. Uh, okay, so let me, let me you know, uh, try to answer your question. So, uh, the, uh, I kind of, you know, it's maybe my fault to advertise as uh, the model I have with Kelvin, you can regard it as a three plus one realization of any model. But that's not what people really, you know, use my model for. So what really they are, you should consider this whole any model thing as nothing important other than just some input data to some theory. And in a sense, that's completely correct because any model is not the most general input. It's just a convenient familiar input for you to get a top particle quantum field theory. So what really this, the general framework should be, you should consider there's something called a spherical two category which is some horrible, complicated mathematical algebraic data. And once you are given this data, you can produce a three plus one top particle quantum field theory. And those anion model is just some very special case of this spherical two category. So, and then what in general you hope is that you have a Hamiltonian schema so that this ground state on any oriented three manifold, the ground state will realize the Hilbert space come out of this three plus one top particle quantum field theory. So what I'm describing right now is <clears throat> you start with the anion model and you could construct this three plus one top particle quantum field theory called Crenieta. And then what I would write down a lattice Hamiltonian on each closed three manifold so that this closed three manifold, uh, the Hilbert space associated to this three manifolds by the Kranieta TQFT is factorially isomorphic to the ground state of my Hamiltonian. So, so that's the general thing I want to think. And any model, it just came as a convenient algebraic data. I see. So, I mean, I understand sort of, okay, so I, I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to make my question more precise. And, and okay. I think you correctly surmised that my question less about the details and more about sort of the general philosophy. And so thank you so much for answering it. I guess one way I could make it more precise would be to ask, is there one-to-one -one correspondence between the three plus one manifold or three plus one TQFT that you're considering and the two plus one dimensional boundary on which you realize whatever um, oh, you oh, okay. answer my method in the Okay, that, that's how I can answer uh, quickly. So uh, those three plus one, if you want to reduce one dimension lower, it's only applied to really any model. Uh, 
so so the thing is, I, I think I know what you are, if I hope this is what you are uh, you know, asking. So if you want to realize the annual model, what you need to do is you need to take a three manifold. Now it also has a boundary. And the boundary would be a closed surface because boundary, boundary has no boundary. And then the theory would be exactly produced the reaching and try of TQFT on this boundary. And uh, this actually, you can see the reason why, you know, you won't have any anomaly in a sense because your anomaly is encoded by this bounding three manifold. So, but this only works for non-degenerate input in the craniata. So, so I think what I'm saying is that if you take the three plus one TKFT of craniata, if your input is a modular tensor category, and then if you study the theory of three manifold with a boundary, and that would reproduce rich Gantrayev theory for that particular annual model. I see, but it sounds like your goal here is more general. The goal is not just to consider a manifold with boundary and reproduce rich uh, Turayev model, right? It sounds like what you're trying to do is something more general, which is to construct this three plus one Q TQFT. Is that correct? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Uh, uh, I consider, you know, this Kranjeta TQFT, you know, in the two plus one setup, it's just like the, you know, Tori code. It's kind of the, uses the examples of a phenomena, but it's far from, you know, general. And I'm really looking for a, you know, I'm looking for more general than what, you know, but I think the first I consider to be a complete understanding is that we can write down Hamiltonian schema to realize the so-called, you know, Douglas Reuter formulation of three plus one TKFT. I consider that's like, kind of like, a, you know, uh, the corresponding to Levin Wen. And then more interesting <clears throat> is to go beyond this. And the ultimate goal is to kind of understand, you know, what's the mathematical uh, lattice version of something like, you know, Sandra Witten, you know, those TKFT, which uh, I think most likely they would be gapless in certain senses, they will have fermions. And but they will be much more powerful topologically, so so that's what I'm really going after. Thank you so much. So, uh, a, oh, sorry, yeah. uh, can I also have a quick question here? So, yeah, 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 of course. yeah. It, is it possible to have two input categories B1 and B2 so that they give the same three plus one state sum TQFT? I'm pretty sure this can happen. Uh, let me tell you why I think it's pretty sure, but I don't, I cannot give you a concrete example. So this is completely analogous to two dimension, yes. you know, two plus one yes. dimension. Yes. Uh, for the level one model, the input, you know, will generate the same theory if they are Morita equivalents. Yes. For yeah. example, yeah. yeah, you know, so yeah. I think the uh, one thing which, you know, as I hoped, uh, it's still not there, is that we know Kranjeta TKFT and uh, should be some kind of topological phase of matter which can be described by the quantum double of the input. Right. But nobody has a formulation of a notion which generalizes uh, the kind of, you know, modular tensor category in three plus one dimension which we can say that, you know, uh, that's what it is. I know there are many candidates, but I don't think that's there yet, which is in the sense of in two plus one dimension, we know in principle, every proper stable uh, top particle order is given by a modular tensor category. And I don't think we have a notion like a modular tensor category, which is supposed to be more general than the double of those kind of input. So if you have such a theory, I, I'm pretty sure you can come up with example as you said, but I don't know any concrete example because I don't know what you are, what we are even looking for. Uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, the theory 
contains excitation more than point excitation. There are also loop excitation, but but I definitely believe that's gonna happen. But so what about the case when the three plus one dtqft is a finite gauge theory, like a digraph witten theory? Do we have a better handle for those? Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, so then, so, for those cases, um, are there such a pair of B one and B two giving the same digraph witten theory? Okay, let me tell you uh, where the difficulty is. So, for Dapper Witten, not twisted, it's completely classical in the sense that you know the dimension of the Hilbert space is given by a group homomorphism from the fundamental group to the group, and the partition function just count how many. Right. And those can be easily match up for different group, but it doesn't mean the theory has to be the same. So, uh, that's why I'm hesitant to say, you know, you can easily show they are the same. You know, just to give an example, uh, you know, for this uh, so-called generalized double semi model, there's a paper by Lukash and uh, Zhu Wang. They say, oh yeah, you know, uh, this model might not be something. And I asked them, you know, why people believe they are the same. They say, oh yeah, they can match up the ground state degeneracy on every manifold. To me, that's a very, interesting but not you know terribly convincing thing to say they are the same because there are plenty of two plus one tqfts and uh, use a linear formula the grounds degeneracy are all the same right. and there are more subtle things to distinguish them and that's right. the same thing with diagraph written so if you want to say two three are the same in principle you need to tell me that these two factors from the category of space time to this have a natural equivalence between them, which means you have to construct a, uh, you know, a natural transformation between them. So that's why I'm hesitant to say, even Dyke for Witten, you know, we know for sure. I see, okay, thank you. Hey, Zhenhan, just yep. uh, following up on uh, Shuhan's question. So if we take the input as unitary modular tensor category, yep. we know the TKFTs are trivial, right? In the sense that all Hilbert space are one dimensions. Yeah. Uh, and let's say the input categories, two input categories have the same chiral central charge. So they even have the same partition function on all simply connected manifolds. Yeah. Can you prove that they are the same TKFT in that sense? For two input unitary module tensor category with the same chiral central charge. I mean, there are many pairs like this. Uh... I would not say, you know, obvious to me. Let me tell you why. Uh, uh, I still, as I said, I don't have very good answer to three plus one. It's just because I don't know the theory of a modular tensor category there. But I can tell you in two plus one. So in two plus one, a partition function are interesting but not that powerful. So for example, if you take the Ising TQFT, and uh, there are eight of them with an infusion rule, right? And, but in terms of partition function, there are only four pairs. So uh, you really don't, you know, you cannot distinguish. What I'm saying is that it's not true, obviously to me that the partition function alone would determine a TQFT completely. And the way the subtle things like a 68 will come in is the following. So the, uh, you defined, uh, you know, suppose you have a partition function, how do you, how do you define uh, you know, the full TQFT? Okay, you say, oh, the first step, I want to define the Hilbert space. How do you define the Hilbert space? You take a three manifolds, you take all the four manifolds with the boundary are these three manifolds. And you form a formal vector space by you know, linear combination of those four manifolds. And then you define the inner product as glue along the boundary. You get a closed fold manifold, then you do the evaluation on, by the partition function of this closed four manifold. And then you want to say, okay, then what's the Hilbert space? The Hilbert space, it just means you need to take this inner product and then mod off the kernel. And the kernel is given by 
some kind of relation between those manifolds. And in the two plus one case I know very well, the kernel is described by the jones Windsor projector. And those things encoded the 6 year symbols. So all I'm saying is that what you speculate is possible, but it's not obvious to me. So, so I kind of believe uh, you know, the diagraph of Witten can be completely settled, but I'm not so sure how easy to settle if you say they all have the same partition function. I, I hope that's, that that's answer your question. I see, thank you. So, uh, so now let me just, uh, you know, uh, tell you, uh, actually, you know, while I prepare, I start to realize there's so much math into it, you know, uh, if, you, if you really want to get to the bottom. So, uh, so the Kryn-Yeta TQFT, as I said, you know, they didn't define the TQFT, they defined the environment. And the way they define the environment is as follows, which actually is a kind of a subtle point, but it's important, you know, where do you label? So you start with, a, let me do this easy case, which is an annual model. And uh, what you do is you start with a four manifold and then you take a triangulation. And what you color are not the obvious ones, which are like, you know, edges or something, you don't. You actually, you color the triangles and the tetrahedron. So with the two simplest and the three sipses. And the standard to think about is that you, instead of thinking about a triangulation, you think about a dual saturation, which means that you take the four simplices, you turn to vertices, you take three simplices, you turn to edges, and you dualize, uh, which I will explain a little bit more. And that's like a better way to think about it. But the original one is that you take your anions, you color all the triangles and all the tetrahedrons. And then uh, as the bottom slide, you know, uh, I won't carefully explain. And then this gives you something of a state sum, which means you can write down quantum dimension of things, and then you do this alternating sum, and that's giving you a four manifold environment. And in order for us to write down the uh, lattice model, I need to think about three manifolds. And here the same thing. I want to color triangles and a tetrahedron. And then if you dualize, and now it's one dimension down, and the three simplices, which are tetrahedron, now they dual to vertices. And then the triangle dual to edges. And all another, you know, would say they are the side of a bond. So that's the original Kranieta environment. So you color triangle and the tetrahedron, and then you write down this state sum. And it turns out that's not the convenient way to do uh, the model. And the convenient way to do is to dualize everything. So uh, that's actually need a notion of a handle decomposition. I don't expect anybody to know this, you know, if you're not a topologist, but I just quickly tell you. And I can hide this in the background, but this is important to understand the subtleties. So a handle is something very simple. So a handle in n dimension, is just n disk. And the only thing you call this a handle is the end disk has a decomposition and which into D to the K, that's the K handle means. And then you cross the complementary dimension. And it's called a handle is because it has a special region in the boundary, which is called the attaching region. So I won't really you know, go through this carefully because this is a hardcore topology, but what it is is just that if you think of a manifold as a simplicial complex, you have a vertices, edges, and the faces. And the bad thing about a simplicial complex is that they have different dimensions. You have a vertex, which is zero dimension, you have edge, which is one dimension. And the handle decomposition just says, you shouldn't do that. You should be more democratic. You should make the vertices also n dimension. You make the edges all n dimension. So that's the handle decomposition. And in picture, it's very easy to imagine what they are. You just take a vertex, you imagine a small neighborhood, and you take an edge, you make also a small neighborhood, and that's a handle decomposition. 
And uh, every manifold has a handle compound, many of them, and uh, they are related to each other. So the model, which I wrote down with Kevin, the theory behind it is a handle decomposition. So that's why the model is better presented on the dual saturation, which I don't need to use the word handle. So, but I want to bring this up so people, if want to chase down the real uh, source of things. So, uh, and then if you think about dually, which is you take a four manifold, you take a triangulation, then you take a dual saturation. And then the horrible state sum like this can be easily write down as this, which is you take your handle decomposition, we have zero handle, one handle, and two handle, three handle, four handle in four dimension. And the Kranjeta environment, you don't need the three handle, four handle. All you need is one, two handles. And then uh, they can be presented as a link inside the three sphere. And then the Kranjeta environment is just that you take the Kirby color, you attach onto each of these components of a link, and then you formal expand, calculate the environment, and then you weight it by a square root of this d square. Uh, that's actually recover the Kranjeta environment. And uh, this actually directly give you a state sum. If you think about the triangulation, you know, just using this actually. So the same state sum can be easily recovered by this formula by take a triangulation and then you take it do a saturation and just write down this sum. So that's the way I would think about the Kranjeta environment. And then uh, it's easy to see from here, actually the Kranjeta environment determined by homotopy. And uh, actually the Kranjeta environment in general, the partition function has a dependence on the first betting number if it's not modular. So uh, I won't really uh, you know, go through, but this also give you uh, Kind of, you can see why this also recovered the Rishkin Triaf environment. So, uh, basically, what it is is the Kranjeta environment is more or less the same as that you take the four manifolds, you write down as handle decomposition 0, 1, 2, and the 0, 1, 2 handle has a boundary which is a three manifold. And the Kranjeta environment is just the invariant of this boundary three manifold. Uh, in the case that X is a closed four manifolds, and uh, this three manifolds is completely trivial. It's either the three sphere or a bunch of S1 cross S2 connect sum. And that's why just the signature. So, so that tells you the Kranjeta theory is really trivial. And uh, then uh, the Hilbert space, if you want to extend uh, the Kranjeta environment into a TQFT, and the Hilbert space is given by ribbon graphs. And uh, this is called the skin space. Uh, so what it is, is you can imagine that take any closed three manifold and uh, instead of a graph, let me take the case without, you know, you know, it's just a bunch of ribbons. So you, but it's very important they are ribbons. So you take a link inside, but now the link is not a circle, you know, for each component. Each component is a, you know, circle thickening to a ribbon, which means, you know, it's a really a annulus. And you think about how the, you know, uh, take a three manifolds, you imagine all the possible ways, any way you want to draw those ribbon links inside the manifold. And then the input category tells you how to introduce relations between them. And this space is the Hilbert space you associate to a three manifolds from the Kranjeta TKFT. So the reason I want to introduce this way is uh, I want to address the most you know, asked question about the model. So what you really think about this is, you know, if you want to realize this Hilbert space by a Hamiltonian, so you have a triangulation, <clears throat> you have all those ribbons floating around inside your manifold. And what you need to do is the Hamiltonian only see the vertices and the edges. You need to push all those ribbons into the vertices and the edges. But the problem with the ribbon is that 
when you push a ribbon onto a line like an edge, and the ribbon can arbitrarily twist around each other. So you have to encode this twisting. Otherwise, you will get inconsistency. And that's the major difficulty to write down those models in general. How do we encode those twistings of a ribbon when you push onto a one skeleton? And uh, so that's basically what we need to realize. So I think basically what I try to tell you right now is that what's the abstract Craniata TKFT dually in terms of handle body and the ribbon graphs. And now the job is to realize this to, you know, the actually real the Hilbert space using a Hamiltonian. So that means we need to write down a Hilbert space, we write down a Hamiltonian so that the ground states form a Hilbert space which is functorially isomorphic to this space, which really is a continuous limit. There are no graph or cellulation at all. So, so I think uh, I probably will go off for another 10 minutes uh, to quickly outline this because now it's very computer science or physics in the sense would be very specific uh, algorithm. So before I continue, any general question? Uh, Please take your time, don't no worry. Well, the problem is I, my wife has a job for me to do, so I couldn't go on forever. I might, I might go on for another 10, 15 minutes of at most, you know, 12, 30. But anyway, so, so this is the uh, <clears throat> general thing we need to do. And uh, it's not, you know, easy uh, for the reason you can already see that, you know, when uh, I mentioned Mon Chen's uh, earlier postal, uh, uh, you know, Williamson, uh, I forgot his first name. So he, he was my, you know, he was a, my visiting student. Uh, Pardon? Dominic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Dominic. Sorry. Sorry. A question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I get the point. I think in your construction, input of uh, 2 plus 1 D TQ of T, output of 3 plus 1 D TQ of T, at some point, I think you mentioned anomaly free statement about anomaly free, but I'm not sure is this anomaly free statement about the uh, framing anomaly free or what anomaly free? Okay, okay. I'm not sure okay. That part, that part. Uh, uh, Thanks. So uh, the the answer to your question uh, is the following. So if you <clears throat> if you think about rich taking tri of TKFT as a two plus one TKFT, and then it has a framing anomaly uh, when the, at least when the central charge is non-zero, and because you cannot define the environment for just a or rented three manifolds. You have to choose a framing. But <clears throat> you can realize the same kind of rich gain trough, you know, Hilbert space using a three plus one TKFT. And this three plus one TKFT to realize as, you know, boundary of a boundary in the sense of it's the boundary of a space manifold instead of space time. And then it's a Kranieta TQFT. Kranieta TQFT is a state sum TQFT. And this one is definitely has no anomaly. There's nothing projective. So, so that's what I mean by a holographic realization of Rick and Tri of TQFT. So as a two plus one TQFT, I would say it has a framing anomaly. And I, as a Kranieta realization, I would say no anomaly because this is state sum TKFT. Okay, thank you. So, is there is there some physical way to say this? Like maybe in two plus one, the the original input theory can have a non-trivial Carroll central charge with framing anomaly. You try to cancel this by some construction from three plus one D. And what will be the physical input? Like well, yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, this related to. Uh, the so so here my you know okay so uh i really you know think about those kind of lattice always related to fractal quantum hall so uh personally i still believe quantum hall states are two plus one 
which means that the quantum Hall state has no significant thickness. And uh, the way the three plus one TQFT realization is basically thinking as, I think this word Shogun mentioned too, the slab idea that if you think about a quantum Hall state has a thickness, which means a two dimensional electron gas have a finite thickness. And then the magnetic field tells you which part is up, which part is down. And the three plus one TKFT idea realization just means you take the bottom thing and you let that guy bounce a three manifold. And that's break the time, you know, that's give you the breaking of the chirality, which means one side is the future, one side is the past or something. So I think these are all related. So it's really, you know, also related to the question I comment about orientation. So if you have a two dimensional manifold, all you need is basic to declare, uh, you know, part of these two parts are kind of, you know, related but different. And that's break the uh, kind of, you know, double structure. So three plus one is just the most dramatic way to break this. So which says, Instead of, you know, I want to realize the theory for a surface, I take your surface and then I break the orientation, <clears throat> you know, or the, the kind of, you know, doubleness by take the three, take the surface and then make it the boundary of a three manifold. And you should consider this three manifold just as the, you know, the, the infinite past, which break the, the, the chirality symmetry, you know, the chirality of the theory. So, so I think that's how I think about this, you know, uh, this three plus one realization. It's kind of a cheating in a sense, but I think this is related to something I ponder uh, sometime, which is, you know, really fractal quantum states, are they really a two dimensional system or they are three plus one, you know, in disguise? which means that maybe it's possible for fractal quantum hole state, you know, the magnetic field, you know, we know fractal quantum hole, the magnetic field, the drive electron, you know, into one edge, but maybe there's some different physics from the bottom to the top, and we should consider this as a three plus one. Anyway, this is completely speculation, but at the moment, I still try to convince myself Fractal quantum Hall state is a two plus one TKFT, not a three plus one. <laughs> okay, any more question? Because the, the rest of the thing will be very, uh, you know, kind of uh, algorithmic because that's, you know, I want to just give you the, because I think the idea is already, I can explain, I will just tell you how things are done for specific manifold. Okay, so, uh, so now I want to, uh, I, I think I already know there are people never seen uh, the model before. So, uh, so let me just quickly recall. So the model uh, in the paper was only written down very carefully for the uh, cubical lattice uh, in uh, three space. And for, you know, physical purposes, uh, we always do periodic boundary condition. So, uh, so what we are, doing is uh, you should think about this cubical lattice not as a triangulation. And the right way to think of them is they should thought as a dual situation of some other triangulation. And then uh, you would put, you know, give me an input, uh, any model or something. And there are L many uh, any types. And then you put this C to the L onto each edge and then you follow the same protocol, uh, you know, just as I said, the basis of the Hilbert space will be labeled one skeleton <clears throat> and they are considered to be orthonormal basis. And then <clears throat> the vertex term will be just fusion rules. And the difficulty is the plaquette terms. And in the original model, <clears throat> we use the symmetry of the cubic lattice to resolve you know, this valence six vertex into the picture on the right. And it's a, we choose a beautiful symmetric resolution so that it's completely symmetrical. 
And then we need to write down a predicate term on each phase. And uh, it turns out the subtlety I mentioned, which is what you are really doing is push a ribbon into those one skeleton. And that's actually need to be taken care of in a very careful way. And the way we take care of this issue is we say the cubicle lattice has a global direction. So we choose a one, one, one direction and you think of this projection. So the whole lattice project onto the plane. And you can ask, you know, why do you want to project to the plane? That's because the graphic calculus of anions is given by planar diagrams. And actually the subtlety is not only the graphic calculus of any as a planar thing, actually it's really not even a planar thing. It's really a one plus one thing because the annual diagram in the most general case, you will need a Y direction. That's the new horizontal edge thing. So, so that's the choice. And this is the question most people ask, which is you know, what this direction is. So really this direction is a global encoding of the framing of the attaching two handles. So, so that's what you know, this thing really is. And once you have this, so uh, I think I already explained this. So the first vertex term is always uh, the fusion rule. So that's you know, very easy. And the uh, plaquette term, which is that you use the one one direction and then you project this one skeleton onto the plane. And then you do what I said before, which is you take the curvy color, you put it into a plaquette. And now the problem is there are this projection of other edges, which you should consider this as one handles. And how this interact with each other. And uh, there are many ways to resolve this. And we choose the easiest way to do it, which is you don't really see them by you can do a ribbon move to bend them out of your picture. And then you just do exactly as I described earlier. And then you conjugate by this, uh, you know, R matrices. And that's how we write down uh, this formula. And I'm really surprised I wrote down the formula which seems to be correct because that's norm normally something I do. Normally anything I wrote down has potential very high probability of wrong. I remember uh, Fiona told me that she checked by the computer, those formulas seem to be correct. But anyway, so if you look at it, it's a very complicated formula. There are so many F symbols and so many R symbols, but in the end, those formula give you commuting projectors. And uh, they should for sure realize the Kranieta TKFT, but I really don't have a proof. So, uh, so now I will just quickly outline the uh, wall, which not in the paper. And now people start to ask me, you know, how to do for the general three manifold. So uh, here's the outline. I think I will just quickly go through. And I think that's actually good actually. So uh, the time is not too bad. So what you do is you start with the general three manifolds. And the manifold actually need to be oriented. And then you choose a triangulation, you choose a branching. And for those who don't know branching, you just you know, order all the vertices uh, you know, globally. And uh, the triangulation, which is what I really mean is the triangulation physicists would think. And which means that you know, any two tetrahedron will share a single triangle and no you know, loop edges of those. Because that's actually, uh, if you do that, make the model really hard to write down. I don't even know how to write down for the most general not triangulation saturation. I need the triangulation to be standard. And then the way I would do it is that you take your triangulation, you put all your tetrahedron into the plane, you know, very standard way, which I will tell you later. And then uh, this is uh, not really the tetrahedron in the plane, it's the dual one, because we will write the model on the dual saturation. So a tetrahedron is a dual to a site, and then the fourth triangle will dual to edges. 
and then we need to know how to write out these four edges in the plane. And I'm also writing a standard way. And then we just carry the same procedure as before. So now the question is, how do you resolve this, you know, thing by writing, you know, this situation into the plane in a standard way? So we need to think about uh, a tetrahedron. Uh, this is a very complicated, you know, tetrahedron to imagine the dual. So uh, first I will introduce some new terminology because it's very confusing when you talk about the triangulation and the dual situation. They both have vertices, both has edges and triangles. So I will call the original triangulation, the vertice edge triangle tetrahedron as they are. And when they dualize, I won't call a vertex in the dual one. I will call the vertex dual to a tetrahedron a site and the, the dual edge a bond and the dual phase a plaquette and that's actually fit into uh, physics terminologies. So now I want to say how you flat out a standard tetrahedron. So because the vertices are ordered, so you can consider the four edge, you know, four vertices you have zero, one, two, three. And then when you dualize, you see the center of the tetrahedron become a site. And then there are four uh, edges come out of this site, which dual to the four triangle faces. And then there are six plaquettes come out of this site that's dualized to the six edges. And then I want to use the order of the vertices as the order of the dual triangle, which is the dual bond. And then you just flatten out onto the plane by using this zero, one, two, three in a, a clockwise. And you want the largest one to be vertical and the other three just on the top horizontally. And the reason we need to be so careful is because the 60th symbol do care about this, not only the cyclical order, also care about the vertical direction. So I will flatten out each tetrahedron onto the plane this way, in a random way, and then connect them using the same rhetorics. And uh, obviously they cannot be embedded in any way, but I just do this. And then uh, the Hilbert space and the vertices, uh, if you thought about those kind of models, completely standard. And now I want to just mention one thing, why I want to color the triangle and the tetrahedron in the Krenjeta TKFT. Now the triangle is dualized to a bond. So now all the bond has colors. And then the tetrahedron is dual to a site. And the site has a color, which is an anion. But the four valent site, I can standard resolve to two trivalent vertices. And the two trivalent vertices has a new bond connecting them. And that new bond Get the new get the color of the tetrahedron, which is dual to the site. So now I get exactly to the standard situation, which is I have a graph and all the edges are colored by anions. And then the Hilbert space, the vertices exactly as before, and the vertex term just enforce the fusion rule. Another difficulty is the plaquette term. And the difficulty for general handle decomposition, which I don't know how to do. It's because I don't know how to project anything or how to you know, understand this twisting of the ribbons. And the way with the triangulation is that I want to say all the plaquette terms, they are dualized to the edges because that's all the two cells come from. And an edge in the standard of triangulation, they have those triangles which go around it. And if you dualize this picture, the whole thing become a cell, a two-dimensional cell. So that's, you can write down a term using this projection into the plane. So what happens is that you take your one skeleton, which is you flatten on the plane, and then each edge give you a dualized edge, which is a two-dimensional cell, which is a disc. And then the disc is immersed onto that graph. And the subtlety about twisting is that you can do the following. So uh, the standard flattening of the one skeleton is already on the plane. And now if you use this edge, when you project onto the plane 
and they also have an order of these four bonds, which are dualized to the triangle. And these four things uh, has an order, but this order might not match the standard one you already flattened out. In order to fix this, uh, you will do some twisting. And this twisting basically is a way to represent the plaquette framing in the planar so-called blackboard framing in the crack way. So if you do this, and then just follow the same procedure, you know, you just draw the loop, the curvy color, and then you just write down all the formulas. And uh, I think this is a very inefficient way to write down the model, but I don't know how to do this without a branching, without a true triangulation, so that I know some local projection directions. And then if you really want to write a computer program, you need to think about two adjacent tetrahedron and how those two adjacent sites are connected with each other in the standard flattening out because at each side there are four bonds and the four bonds, every two bond a, a cell and you need to know there's a six cell, how this connect with the other six cells. So there are 36 different possibilities and you have to enumerate all of them in order to write down the Hamiltonian. So it's very complicated and it's very impractical because if you take any three manifold, if you want a true triangulation, you need a lot of tetrahedron. And I really don't know how to write them down without using a true triangulation. So uh, I think I will just quickly go through a few things uh, that all those models are stable in the sense that uh, they should satisfy the TQ1, TQ2 condition of Hastings and others. And I couldn't prove this for uh, the model which I just described, but I can prove this for the Lewin Wei model. So uh, this satisfies the ground state of error crashing code, which I can map onto the disk axiom. And they also, the ground state have to be homogeneous. I can map this onto the annulus axiom. And uh, there are two more directions to go. Uh, like I won't talk about them at all, but I don't think it's, so I will just quickly mention already has a lot of discussion, which is uh, I really hope somebody can figure out a way to do the carver ones in two dimension, not cheating in three dimension as I did, uh, because I do believe from whole are two dimensional systems. So there are two interesting directions for lattice model. One is, uh, you know, the chiral theory, how to do them in true two dimension. And then the other is fractons. And I won't really talk about fractons at all. So I think I'm happy to skip them. So I will just go to the last slide uh, and take any question you have. So, uh, oh, I think the last slide. So uh, I think the interest to me is that uh, I do believe that lattice model are very important for a general mathematical understanding of a quantum field theories. And the reason I'm terribly very interested in it because I have an application in mind, which is I want to prove or disprove the so-called quantum church thesis that quantum field theory won't give you any new computation power other than quantum mechanics, which is the quantum computing model. And also I think lattice model give you a mathematical way to understand physical phenomena, which are algorithmic, you know, and uh, the complexity point of view. And without those kind of, you know, rigorous mathematical framework, I think all the discussion is, you know, important, but there is a possibility of we missing some subtle important phenomena. Okay, with this, I will stop here. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zephan, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm happy to take any more questions for another five minutes or something. Yes. So. Okay. Before I just wondering because you only have a, maybe a few slides on fracton. Can you just make comments on what you prepare? Since you already so, prepared. Uh, maybe I will just take more slides. Uh, so, well, uh, okay. So maybe I will take one slide. So uh, maybe this slide. So, uh, you know, I knew Zhu Wang when he was a graduate student. And uh, every time for many years, every time I saw him, I will ask Zhu Wang, 
can you write out your model on general three manifolds? His answer is always no. And uh, I took that as a hint. His fractal model has a very subtle structure. And uh, the good thing, and also a bad thing of the model I just described is that it can be written down for any situation. And I consider that's a terrible thing because it probably means it's not very physical. So the hard code has this problem, which is you cannot write them down for any three manifold. So I've been thinking for this quite a while. And I came to the conclusion that the model really should be considered as leave on the fundamental group of the three manifold. And you should consider the fundamental group as a lattice, not inside your manifold, but inside the universal cover. Because what you can do is you take any point in your manifold and then the universal cover will have a collection of them. And that's one while corresponding to elements of the fundamental group. And then I think the generalization of a periodic boundary condition is a finite index normal subgroup of the fundamental group. And uh, you have to go beyond framing in order to deal with general three manifold for hard code. And uh, I don't like the answer, but at the point, the best I can do is the structure I need for the three manifold is a pair of finite subset of the fundamental group. And then if you give me all those data, I can write down the hard code on any three manifolds. And I think the most interesting of hard code is is challenge our understanding of continuous quantum field theory. Because I think uh, Nati, you know, every time, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I talk, well, I talk to him, I really want to know how much we can do uh, to get a continuous limit of hard code. And I would just want to want to say one thing about hard code is that uh, there are much more examples than just hard code. And there's a hard B code. And it's more complicated that each side has four qubits. And there's a generalization I had with other people. You can take any two cube qubits. And uh, I'm really interested in what kind of continuous theory we would get for those lattice model if we do have continuous limit at all. And I think this will be not like the model we I have discussed, which is the exist on any lattices. And I think they should be special, very special, you know, constraint lattices. So that's basically the main thing I want to convey using uh, the hard code or fractals. Uh, uh, can I have a quick question? But what about the okay. X cube model? That's yeah. presumably easier. Is there yes. some, some quasi TQFT? For the X I think that one, uh, I think that one probably has a relatively good answer already. So you know, for the very beginning, I start to suspect that you know they can be constructed using gap to domain walls. I think there's a concrete proposal that you know many fractal models can be considered as uh, you know uh, TKFT with the domain walls. So that would just mean that. Uh, they are TQFTs relative to some kind of classical background or something. So I think S cube would fit into that kind of thinking. Uh, but I would be surprised hard code is like that because the hard code has very strange ground state degeneracy. And it's also, there's a, fundamentally different thing about hard code and S cube, which I didn't really, uh, I think I have the slide, but I didn't comment on. Uh, yeah, this slide. So uh, the, there's a theorem from quantum information science. If you write down a local commuting Hamiltonian, and you can ask, you know, as a mathematician, we always do, what you can do the most good dream thing so that the ground state degeneracy can go as fast as you can. And it turns out you cannot be 
you know, unconstrained. The ground state degeneracy can at most go as exponential to the, uh, I think it's the linear size to the dimension minus two. And that's the at most you can go. Uh, I think the S cube has a slower growth rate. I think something like a linear size or something. And uh, the hard code secure this bond, which means hard code is as bad you can get or as good you can get depends on your point of view in terms of growth of ground state degeneracy. So that's why I expect the website slightly different. E is three, right? Both, uh, yeah, the log of the ground state degeneracy for X cube grows linearly. And I thought that saturates this down. I thought it's a coefficient can be different, right? Oh, you are talking about the coefficient. That I don't know. But I don't think, uh, but I don't think the ground state degeneracy is a, is the distinction between these two models, right? So if you put the X cube model on some complicated foliated manifolds, then the ground state degeneracy can also be quite complicated and depends on the number of theoretic properties of the foliation and the lattice. Okay, I, maybe you're right, but I, I well, okay. Uh, so I think I have the formula somewhere. Uh, okay, here. Uh, so, Maybe I remember wrong. So the gross state degeneracy in the fattest growth uh, is two to the K. So. Well, K at most is L. When L is. Oh, uh, okay. So, two. well, that's consistent. That's definitely what I, what I, so the, the formula is a E to the L D minus two, right? So D equals three. So that's consistency. Yes. Okay, maybe the S cube can also grow that fast. I don't know. Uh, but, but I didn't way, remember the point, but I thought, you know, at least in the paper I participate, I, I remember there's some constant come from first batting number or something. Yes. Uh, uh, you, yeah. Yeah. The I thought it's something like half uh, linear LX, you know, this is two to the L, right? Yes. And the coefficients depends on some batting numbers. Okay, maybe maybe I got that. Maybe they are, but but anyway, okay. I don't know if that's the case. Maybe maybe I could be wrong that the hard code also can be generated as. A, oh, actually, no. I think it's probably true. Then I remember I have this discussion with the guy. Uh, I forgot his name. I didn't get an update on if they can reproduce. I think maybe they can. Okay, maybe I was wrong. Maybe yeah. maybe yeah. this hard code are also. Maybe hard code are not special in this respect with uh, X cube. Yeah. Maybe they are also can be reproduced using two cap T with gap to boundaries or something. Okay. Right. I think in this paper by uh, Dominic is one of the authors and also Dave. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the paper I, I had. It's a Dave yeah. Ace Dominic. With the B code in that paper. What? Not hard code, but the B code. Mm -hmm. Did they have the B code now? Yeah, they had it in that paper a year ago. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe I was wrong this part then. Uh, maybe, they maybe they construct hard code itself now. They do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then, then you know, I can be no. Then I definitely, you know, I would take back what I said. The difference between X cube and uh, hard code. If that's the case, then I don't know the subtle difference between the two now. But they could both be generated by, you know, T cap T with gap boundaries. So well, uh, is the paper on hard code on archive now or something you it, just it, know? Dave, Dave just said. <laughs> oh, I just said, okay. Okay, great. great. That paper yeah, okay. Not... Yeah, I, I, okay. I mis misremember that degeneracy there. Okay, so then maybe, maybe they are all can be generated, you know, if, if the, well, of course there are more models, but if they can generate a hard A, hard B, I, I would believe they can generate everything. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think there's a more recent Thing I heard from Dominic, Dominic Williamson, that they can show that every poly stabilizer code can be generated this way, you know, whether it's whatever fracton model it is. Oh, really? 
Yeah. If that's the case, that means in potential, they can also generate all the generalization which I had. Well, Z2 polystabilizer, not, not sure that it covers your generalization. Yeah. Okay, then, okay, then I don't know the difference between S cube and uh, hard code in terms of the continuous limit then. Well, Sahan has a question. Sure, Maybe yeah. Could... Yeah, hello. So I have a question. So in two plus one dimension, we know that there are TQFDs that are not state sum, like transcimals that are not yeah. coming from the dream force center of something. So my question is, uh, do we know an example in three plus one dimension? Is there a unitary three plus one dimensional uh, TQFD that is not a state sum? That's a great question. The answer is very simple. I don't know. I wish there are. <laughs> okay. So, uh, as a personal, you know, I thought about this question quite a bit actually. So, uh, I want to believe in order to study this kind of uh, what you said, you know, three plus one TKFT, I need to study five plus one TKFT because that's the philosophy I just, you know, followed that the rich can try of TKFT two plus one can be thought as a three plus one, it become a state sum. So if what you are asking, I don't know the answer, I wish there are, then I should study five plus one TKFT, which are state sum, and then try to reduce down to three plus one. Now the trouble or the problem is three plus one and four plus one are fundamentally different. And this is a topological problem. So every three manifold is the boundary of a four manifold, but a very few manifolds of four manifolds are boundary of five manifolds. And there's a obstruction for four manifolds to be a five manifolds boundary, which the signature has to be zero. So CP2 cannot have a, you know, cannot be bound by five manifolds. So I don't believe this idea of study five plus one TKFT would capture all the subtleties of three plus one TKFT. So I just don't know the answer to your question, but personally I believe they should exist. We just don't know how to do it. I see. I have another question. So in your construction uh, of state sum TQF is in three plus one dimension, uh, you start with a braided fusion category. Is that yes. right? Yeah. So, but by uh, Reuters and uh, Douglas construction, any two fusion category can also lead to a state sum. Yeah. So are so, these the same or not? Are fusion two categories beyond just braided fusion categories? No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, those braided uh, fusion category are special cases of them. So they're categorical number. So I think uh, the word spherical fusion two category. So fusion and two added up to three. So it's all some special three category. So braided tensor category are special three categories. So are their spherical fusion two category are also some special three categories. So the general theorem should be, you know, there's some kind of special three category would give a rise to all the stable three plus one TKFTs. And I believe their notion of spherical fusion two category is the right notion. So is there any example of a spherical fusion two category that is not coming from a braided, just fusion one category? Yeah, I think you take like, a, you know, it's the same. I think you take a braided tensor category, you take all their module categories that's form some thing which is not braided right away, but I would believe in the end, the three plus one TKFT you get is nothing new. It's just the same thing as if you take a two plus one TKFT, uh, you can start with a final group G, which is non abelian. And that's a, uh, that's a fusion category, which is not braided, but you can also start with 
the representation category of a finite group. That's actually braided. And if you do the triple visual construction, you get exactly the same two plus one T cap T because representation G and WAC G are Merida equivalents. So I think this is exactly the same phenomena. If you take a braided tensor category, if you use it representation category as a spherical fusion two category, they won't be in general braided, but they will unfortunately won't give you anything new. And, uh, but I think the last time I asked them, they don't know a proof, they are the same, which means they are Morita two equivalents or something. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Han, uh, for the wonderful lectures. You know, he says, which was saying, saying first, otherwise his wife might be angry. <laughs> okay, yes, uh, I need to, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you guys. So I think I, I have to go now. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.